The United Kingdom, a nation steeped in history, culture and ancient legends. But behind the veil of this fascinating land lies a secret that has intrigued mankind for decades. Across the UK, reports of UFO sightings have multiplied, generating curiosity, fear and disbelief. Close encounters, alleged photographic evidence and extraordinary testimonies will lead us to explore the inexplicable in search of clues that may finally shed light on these celestial mysteries. UFO sightings in Britain have a rich and time-honoured history, making the country second in the world for reported sightings of unidentified flying objects. As a result, the British Ministry of Defence, or MOD, has played an important role in collecting and analysing UFO reports. Suffice to say that from 1950 until 2009, the MOD managed the UFO Project, an official investigation into UFO sightings, leading to the compilation of thousands of documents and testimonies currently kept in the British State Archive. However, in 2009, the MOD announced the closure of the project, arguing that the UFO analysis had no UK defence value. Since then, the British government has ceased to officially collect reports and investigate UFO sightings. Despite this, independent organisations and enthusiasts of the phenomenon continue to report sightings in Britain. There are research groups such as BUFORA, an acronym for the British UFO Research Association, which continue to collect information and investigate these cases. It is important to underline that most of the UFO sightings reported over time can be explained in a rational way. It is in fact very common that natural phenomena, conventional aircraft or other terrestrial objects can be mistaken for spaceships from other worlds. And this phenomenon, although it seems improbable, is actually much more common than public opinion thinks. This is explained and supported by the fact that the society in which we live has for years introduced the imagery of alien visitors ready to descend to Earth via flying saucers into pop culture. However, there are still unusual and unexplained cases that remain open to interpretation. But why is the UK such a big hotspot for UFO sightings? The answer, according to some experts, could be found in the history of the country, that although today has lost much of its influence in the world and its empire has now fallen, there was a time when the British represented a great power, perhaps the only world superpower. Over the centuries, the British Royal Navy has been one of the most powerful navies in the world, allowing the UK to protect its influence and protect its maritime interests around the world. During the Victorian era, the British Navy dominated the seas, ensuring control of trade routes and establishing bases and colonies in different parts of the globe. The sun never sets on the British Empire. This was the motto that best represented the reality of a colonial domain that extended for 17 million kilometres, from the southern tip of New Zealand to Queen Elizabeth Island, between Canada and the Arctic Circle. The dominance of the British Crown over vast areas of the planet lasted for two centuries, projecting itself into the first half of the 20th century, or the period that would have seen the world change forever in just 50 years. During both world wars, the United Kingdom obviously played a leading role. During the Second World War in particular, the British Royal Air Force fought with valour and determination in the defence of the nation and in the liberation of Europe from Nazi fascism. Subsequently, during the Cold War, it played the role of a preferred ally of the United States against the Soviet Union, developing complex espionage technologies and achieving the status of a nuclear power, a nation possessing its own atomic arsenal.
And although formally the empire ended in 1997 with the cession of Hong Kong to the Republic of China, the United Kingdom still maintains significant global influence. The British Armed Forces are equipped with advanced and classified equipment for peacekeeping missions, counter-terrorism operations and training of local forces in different parts of the world. In addition, the UK is a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, giving it an influential role in the overseeing of international security policies. Perhaps it is due to all these factors that during the 20th century, this nation of just over 200,000 square kilometers turned into a hotspot for unidentified aerial phenomena, second only to the United States of America. But what is behind these UFO sightings? German spy planes during the two world wars, or Russians during the more than 40 years of the Cold War, or even tests of innovative fighter bombers in His Majesty's service, and finally, the most suggestive and imaginative theory. Why couldn't it be ships coming from other worlds? But to clarify what flies through the skies of the British archipelago, we have to take a step back in history, almost a thousand years. The first UFO sighting in Britain dates back to at least the 12th century, when a group of religious pilgrims in southwest England reported seeing a blazing dragon belching fire emerge from the sea, fly into the air and disappear into the skies. Obviously, nobody knows the details of this event and it is clear that it is impossible to reach an explanation of what these pilgrims really saw. Six centuries later, a document drawn up by the British physician Cromwell Mortimer in 1746 became known under the title of Letter on Fireballs Cited Over London. Cromwell was the secretary of the Royal Society at the time and as he was walking home in the Westminster area of central London, he observed a ball of light in the sky. He drew a sketch of the mysterious object and published it several years later in the Philosophical Transactions, volume 43 of 1746. He wrote, As I was returning home from the Royal Society to Westminster on Thursday, December the 16th, 1742, at 8.40 p.m., being about the middle of the parade in St. James's Park, I saw a light arise from behind the trees and houses in the south by West Point, which I took at first for a large skyrocket. But when it had risen to the height of about 20 degrees, it took a motion nearly parallel to the horizon, but waved in this manner and went on to the north by East Point over the houses. Its motion was so very slow that I had it about half a minute in view and had time enough to contemplate its appearance fully. It had a flaming head and a gradually fading tail of light. It should be noted that in the historical context of the 18th century, sightings of unusual or unexplained aerial phenomena were often described as fireballs or will-o'-the-wisps. These phenomena were often associated with popular beliefs, superstitions and religious interpretations. Today, the explanation for this event could probably be attributed to ball lightning or the passage of a meteor. It is interesting to note that while Mortimer's 1746 paper does not refer specifically to UFOs as we understand them today, it nonetheless represents a historical example of the sighting of an unusual aerial phenomenon, and it's intriguing to note the interpretations and explanations people could attach to such sightings at the time. Over the centuries, other stories relating to strange objects in the sky were passed down in British folklore. However, detailed reports of UFO sightings began to increase in the 20th century. One of the first notable cases occurred at Paulton Down in Wiltshire in 1909, where a group of witnesses reported seeing a mysterious object in the night sky, described as a shining star. However, the imperial government 
for the entirety of the first four decades of the 20th century paid no attention to these testimonies from its citizens. In order to have a first official recognition of the UFO phenomenon, we will have to wait until 1944, a crucial year for the fate of the war and of the United Kingdom. It was August the 5th, 1944, when the British wartime Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, forbade the leaking of information about an alleged UFO sighting in the skies over the English Channel. This testimony remained in the state archives for over 50 years. According to documents released on August 5, 2010 by the Ministry of Defence concerning UFO cases in the United Kingdom, the report to Churchill states that the incident involved an RAF reconnaissance aircraft returning from a mission to France or Germany. The aircraft was presumed to be flying over or approaching the UK coast when it was suddenly intercepted by a strange metallic object, which would have followed its course and speed for a period of time, before accelerating and disappearing. The flight crew reportedly took many photos of the object, which they said was greatly intrigued by their aircraft, even approaching it and circling it, with a freedom of movement and grace not common for heavy aircraft of the time. It should be noted that although this case has been made public, the photos of the alleged flying object have never been released, and this is certainly a detail that deepens the mystery. During the 1950s, as public interest in UFOs increased, the British government launched Project UFO, later known as Project Condine from 1996 to 2000, to investigate sightings of unidentified flying objects and gather information. Only in 2006, the information gathered in these decades was disclosed through the publication of a report entitled Unidentified Aerial Phenomena in the UK Air Defence Region. During this period, a number of sightings were recorded across the country, including the famous observation by a pilot named James Howard, who claimed in 1954 that he saw a flying saucer over Scotland. As happened with the sighting over the English Channel, he also reports having noticed a silvery object with a triangular shape, this time that would have accompanied his military transport plane for a few miles, flying very close, and then, without making a sound, it flew away at high speed, disappearing into the clouds. As we can see, unlike what has happened in the United States of America, the majority of UFOs in the United Kingdom were sighted by members of the Air Force. But not all of these phenomena are seen by the human eye. Some also appear in airborne monitoring radars, such as the famous Lake and Heath Bentwaters incident. At 9.30 p.m. on August 13, 1956, Bentwaters Air Force Base in Suffolk detected a signal that appeared to be an aircraft approaching the base from the sea. The speed of this signal was estimated to be several hundred kilometers per hour, but in addition to this, there were other smaller, slower signals that were coming from the northeast. Under the radar operator's confused gaze, they merged into a larger signal before rapidly vanishing to the north. Shortly thereafter, another signal appeared and moved rapidly from east to west. To investigate the incident, a T-33 fighter bomber instructor of the 512th Fighter Interceptor Squadron took to the air, carrying Lieutenants Charles Metz and Andrew Rowe on board. They were tasked with investigating the radar contacts, but after several reconnaissance flights, they were unable to see anything in the area and were subsequently recalled to base. An hour or so later, more precisely at 10.55 p.m., a new signal was detected approaching from the east. Incredibly, it seemed to reach a speed between 3,000 and 6,000 kilometers an hour, and in a few seconds, it would have passed over the base before disappearing, 
only to reappear to the west. Meanwhile, observers stationed on the ground at the control tower saw a white light sweeping across the base. Also, the pilot of a C-47 military transport aircraft flying at an altitude of 1200 meters above the base reported seeing a similar light pass under his aircraft. All of these events occurred in close proximity to each other. After receiving a notification, the Lake and Heath base, located approximately 60 kilometers northwest of Bentwaters, was placed on high alert. Ground personnel reported seeing several luminous objects, one of which made a sudden change of direction, while two others appeared to merge before separating. But this time, radars did not register any of these anomalies, at least until midnight. A crucial moment of the incident, documented in the report of Sergeant Forrest Perkins, who worked as a radar supervisor at the Lake and Heath Air Traffic Control Center. In Perkins' report, a signal was picked up by radar base to the southwest shortly after midnight. This signal then continued in a northwesterly direction before abruptly ending. Two DH-112 Venom fighter bombers were dispatched from nearby Water Beach Base to intercept the unidentified flying objects. The lead pilot, guided by ground radar, made contact with the aircraft's radar and spotted a bright light ahead of him before losing connection. The pilot was then alerted by ground radar that the signal had moved behind his aircraft. Despite the pilot's evasive maneuvers, the plane was chased by the mysterious signal for 10 minutes. The pilot reported no visual contact and also reported that the signal was picked up by the aircraft's radar for a short time before heading in a northerly direction and disappearing completely. In the early hours of the morning, radars at Lake and Heath picked up another signal about 40 kilometers southwest of Bentwaters, which moved in a northwesterly direction and then stopped. The signal was the only one detected by the radars of both bases. The intervention of other aircraft was requested, but this signal too quickly disappeared, and from that moment on, there were no others. From the 50s, which was a very difficult period for British citizens, gripped by the pains of a huge post-war economic crisis, we move on to the 60s, a period of change and fervour that would lead to the genesis of a new nation capable of exporting its arts and culture, from music to film, all over the world. But in this climate of renewal in the cities, the countryside remained anchored to those traditional rights and values, and it is right here, in the small villages, where stories came to light that still fascinate enthusiasts of mysteries. The Warminster Thing One of the best-known sightings of the 1960s occurred in Warminster, Wiltshire, where several people claimed to have seen objects and heard strange noises coming from the sky. This phenomenon, known as the Warminster Thing, attracted a lot of media attention and led to the arrival of numerous ufologists in the area. The sightings of unidentified flying objects in Warminster began in December 1964, when two police officers claimed to have seen a huge ball of light in the night sky. From that moment, a number of similar sightings occurred, with reports describing flying objects of different shapes and sizes. What made the Warminster phenomenon particularly intriguing were the strange sounds that often accompanied the sightings. City residents reported noises of explosions, bangs, buzzes and rumbles coming from the sky with no visible source. These mysterious noises were sometimes associated with UFO sightings. It was a cold December night when two officers from the nearby police station were driving along a dirt road a few kilometers from the town. Suddenly, they found themselves irradiated by a light coming from three different globes suspended about 10 meters above the ground. They abruptly stopped the car, and from inside it, they silently observed that peculiar phenomenon, until, regardless of what could have happened, they turned the key in the ignition, started the engine, and slowly began to approach 
those three lights. However, like sentient entities, they began to move away in unison from the car. Thus, a very short chase was born, which ended, as we have often seen, with the three unidentified objects making a rapid ascent into the sky until they disappeared into the night. Over the following weeks, the story of this alleged close encounter spread like wildfire throughout the county, and as often happens in these cases, many people came forward declaring that they had seen UFOs or even had encounters with beings from other worlds. However, in the vast number of stories, often born from the minds of those who are ready to do anything to get publicity, some quite interesting ones stood out, since they didn't have to do with the vision of a particular object, but the perception of a continuous and extremely annoying sound, able to get into the heads of its victims, giving them severe headaches. It all began on Christmas Eve 1964. Mrs. Mildred Head was in her bed when she was awakened at 1.25am by strange sounds. They began as soft as twigs being dragged across the roof and then changed to a noise that she described as hailstones. Mildred got out of bed to look out of the window, however discovering that the sky was clear. In the meantime, the noise had turned into a sharp hiss that echoed in her head for a few long moments and then disappeared. Some hours later, that Christmas morning, more than 30 soldiers at Nook's camp, about four miles from Warminster, were rudely awakened by a loud noise. Everyone thought that the noise came from an airplane intent on flying over the base, but there were no traces of it on the radar, and after a few minutes, as happened previously, the sound simply disappeared. While at six in the morning, two other citizens of Warminster were victims of this phenomenon. The first was Mrs. Bai, who, going to Mass, was attacked by the noise, which inexplicably prevented her even from moving, while a few minutes later it was the turn of the village postman, who heard loud metallic noises above the roof of his house, which disappeared into thin air after a few seconds. These four individual events were the spark or if we wish the genesis of a media case that overwhelmed this small community in southern England for over two decades. Tens if not hundreds of people reported being awakened in the middle of the night by loud and eerie explosions, often followed by vibrations or jolts. The noises were sometimes so intense as to break the glass in the windows or shake the structures of the buildings. Reports of the Warminster noises were varied and widespread, with some reporting hearing them as a single explosive noise, while others described them as a series of bangs or detonation-like noises. Some residents reported hearing a reverberation or echo after the noises, while others reported hearing a sound similar to a powerful shock wave. These noises could occur at any time of day, but they were particularly frequent during the night. Despite attention and investigative efforts, the exact origin of the Warminster noises has never been fully explained or understood. Several theories have been put forward to explain the phenomenon, including underground explosions, secret military tests, unusual atmospheric phenomena, and obviously paranormal or extraterrestrial interference. Skeptics suggest the noises may have been the result of pranks or mass collective suggestion. Others speculate that the noise may have been caused by some kind of natural phenomenon, such as the refraction of sound or the propagation of seismic waves. However, none of these explanations could provide a definitive answer to the phenomenon. Towards the end of the 1970s, the Warminster noises gradually subsided, and today the phenomenon is less frequent than in the past. But the memory of these mysterious noises 
continues to fascinate enthusiasts of paranormal and unexplained events, and that's why Warminster still remains a place of interest for UFO history in the UK. In the heart of the majestic Berwyn Mountains, way back in 1974, an event took place that still fascinates UFO enthusiasts and paranormal researchers today – the Berwyn Mountain UFO Incident. It was a cold and dark night of January the 23rd when a series of incomprehensible events shook the tranquility of the mountain valleys. In that remote region of Wales, a wave of UFO sightings spread among the local population, generating fear and astonishment. The key testimony that night came from a woman named Pat Evans. After hearing a loud bang, Pat noticed a blinding light through the window of her house. Shocked, she looked out over the mountains and witnessed an explosion of intense light, followed by an unreal silence. The news spread like wildfire, and it was soon discovered that a considerable number of local residents had witnessed a similar phenomenon. They described unidentified flying objects hovering above the mountain peaks, and their testimony fueled the mystery of the Berwyn Mountain incident. But what could have caused such sightings? Conspiracy theorists and UFO enthusiasts speculated on various explanations. Some suggested it was a secret plane crash or a military test, while others went further, claiming it was an encounter with an extraterrestrial spacecraft. Official investigations, however, came up with a different explanation. Authorities said the event was likely linked to a 3.5 magnitude earthquake that occurred in the region that same night. It was hypothesized that the bright light and the roar could be explained by a seismic phenomena, such as a kind of seismic flash. But this official explanation did not appease public interest. The Berwyn Mountain mystery persists to this day, with some ufologists convinced the evidence had been covered up or withheld by the British government. Conspiracy theories suggest the incident was a cover-up to hide the truth about extraterrestrial encounters. This incident has been called Britain's Roswell, so much so that the Sun newspaper jokingly referred to it as the Roswellsh incident. This playful nickname derives above all from a particular conspiracy theory relating to the UFO crash and subsequently to the transport of the aircraft inside a secret military base called Rudlow Manor, or the British Area 51. In the heart of scenic Wiltshire, England, sits the military base of Rudlow Manor, a site that has been the subject of UFO speculation and conspiracy theories. According to the most passionate ufologists, this base would have played a crucial role in the mystery of the sightings of unidentified flying objects. Through the enveloping mists and ancient trees of the English countryside, Rudlow Manor rises like an imposing fortress. Its centuries-old stone walls hide deep secrets, which only a few dare to reveal. It is here that the darkness of the universe meets the secret hidden by the government. For ufologists, at least until 2000, the year of its closure, Rudlow Manor would have been the nerve center of an international conspiracy to hide the truth about UFOs and extraterrestrials. Conspiracy theorists suggest that the military base hosted secret laboratories where alien technologies were studied and reproduced. According to some witnesses, the archives of Rudlow Manor are full of classified documents, videos and photographs of UFO sightings, capable of revealing shocking details about the secrets of the cosmos. The base, according to the theory, also had connections to other military bases around the world, creating a secret network of knowledge about UFOs and close encounters. This alleged consortium of powers 
whose roots date back to events of historical importance, would have taken over the reins of human destiny, hiding the truth about the existence of other life forms in the cosmos. However, it is important to note that these claims have not found support in hard evidence. Many skeptics argue that the reports relating to this base are just fictional stories. Tainted by the sensationalist press that often permeates UFO stories. Despite this, the aura of mystery surrounding Rudlow Manor remains unchanged, even today. Also known as the Broadhaven Beetle Incident, this is a 1977 sighting of unidentified flying objects in the town of Broadhaven in Pembrokeshire, Wales in the UK. In 1977, several people in this Welsh village reported luminous flying objects hovering in the sky, a being wearing a metallic spacesuit, and even several ghostly figures appearing in the trees. Witnesses included 14 children from Broadhaven Primary School, who claimed an alien had landed in their playground. The children described the object as being made of metal and having a dome with a window. The teachers didn't believe the children's strange story, so the principal separated them and asked them to draw what they had seen. There were slight variations in the drawings made by the children, but what was drawn looked mostly the same. Two months later, Rosa Granville, who ran the Haven Fort Hotel in nearby Little Haven, reported seeing an object that looked like an upside-down saucer and two humanoid beings with pointed heads. Rosa said the object emitted a heat so intense it made her face burn. The woman stated, Lights and flames of every colour came out of the object. Then, out of those flames, came creatures I had never seen before. During the events, several theories were proposed to explain the wholly bizarre and seemingly minor sightings. Nicholas Edwards, then MP for Pembroke, contacted the MOD after being inundated with UFO reports. Lieutenant Cohen, an RAF officer from Brody, surveyed the site but found no evidence of a landing. No traces were found on the ground. In his report, Cohen mentioned the possibility that a local prankster had masterminded everything. Cohen also mentioned the possibility that the description of the aliens matched exactly the type of protective suit that would have been worn in the event of a fire at one of the local oil refineries. He jokingly added, should a UFO arrive at RAF Brody, we will charge the normal landing fees. Subsequent sightings occurred in the area, with accounts from adults and children reporting seeing unidentified flying objects in the sky over Broadhaven. Several witnesses also came forward who claimed to have seen alien-like creatures near the objects. The Broadhaven incident attracted the attention of national and international media, generating interest and debate on the possibility of a close encounter with extraterrestrials. However, Despite the testimonies and the interest aroused, no concrete evidence has been provided to confirm the presence of extraterrestrial objects or creatures in the area. Some skeptics have suggested that the sightings may have been misunderstandings or rational explanations, such as aircraft lights or atmospheric phenomena. Others have speculated that the children either made up their story or were influenced by science fiction events or films. Despite everything, the Broadhaven incident remains one of the best known cases of UFO sightings in the United Kingdom and continues to arouse interest and debate among ufologists and enthusiasts of the UFO phenomenon. The story left its mark on popular culture making Broadhaven a popular destination for UFO enthusiasts and curious tourists. The Robert Taylor incident, also known as the Deckmont Woods incident, occurred in Scotland 
1979. Robert Taylor, a forestry worker from Livingston, West Lothian, claimed he had an encounter with an unidentified flying object. On November the 9th, 1979, Taylor was working alone in Deckmont Woods. As he regularly did, he parked his pickup truck by the side of a road near the M8 motorway and walked along a woodland path with his dog. According to his testimony, he noticed an unidentified metal object above him. He described it as a flying dome, or a large circular sphere about 20 feet in diameter suspended above the forest floor in a clearing about 400 meters away from his truck. The object was dark in color and appeared to be covered in some sort of metallic material with a rough texture, like sandpaper, characterized by an outer edge with small propellers. Taylor finally claimed that he smelled the smell like burnt brakes, and that as he got close to the object, two smaller spiked spheres extended from the large sphere and grabbed him. Taylor lost consciousness, and when he recovered, he was on the ground, with his clothing torn and dirty. He didn't remember what happened after the attack. After the incident, Taylor headed to nearby Livingston Police Station to report what had happened. The police were surprised by Taylor's state of shock and visible injuries. They also conducted an investigation into the incident, but found no conclusive evidence of the flying object or assault that Taylor had alleged. Taylor underwent several medical tests and was found to have injuries to his eyes and legs. His story attracted media attention and the incident became an object of interest to ufologists and paranormal enthusiasts. Despite speculation about the nature of the event, no convincing explanation has been found for Robert Taylor's incident. Some skeptics have speculated that he may have been the victim of a hallucination or an epileptic seizure. However, Taylor has always maintained that the meeting was real and that he was involved in an unexplainable event. On June the 6th, 1980, coal miner Zygmunt Adamski, 56, left his home in Tingley, West Yorkshire, to do his shopping. The man never came home again. On June the 9th, his body was found atop a 10-foot pile of coal in the town of Todd Morden, 20 miles from his home. Sent to investigate, local policeman Alan Godfrey examined the body. His face was frozen in an expression of pure terror. Adamski was wearing a suit, but his shirt, wallet and watch were all missing. Adamski's hair had been cut in a way that Godfrey described as roughly cut. The young policeman also reported that Adamski had mysterious burns on his neck, head and shoulders, which is by far the most disturbing feature of this mysterious case. The coroner, James Turnbull, confirmed that some of the burns had been treated with a strange ointment, which could not be identified by forensic scientists. Speaking to reporters, Godfrey said there was a possibility Adamski had been abducted by aliens. I'm open-minded, I can't rule it out, were his words. The true cause of this poor miner's death remains a mystery to this day. The most absurd and improbable theories were pinned to this news story. Some claimed that Adamski had been killed by KGB agents, others that he had been struck by ball lightning, and still others that he owed a debt to someone to be avoided. For most mystery lovers, however, there was only one explanation. Adamski had encountered aliens and it had cost him his life. Five months after the gruesome discovery of Adamski's body, the small town of Todd Morden once again found itself at the centre of media attention. In the centre of events, we again find Officer Godfrey who apparently, after the Adamski case, 
became of particular interest to extraterrestrial entities. Sent at five in the morning to take care of escaped cattle, Godfrey, according to his own account, was in his car and was crossing a country road when the car stopped suddenly and a beam of very powerful light appeared before his eyes. Godfrey described it as a brilliant light in the sky, a diamond-shaped rotating vessel, five metres high and fifteen metres wide. Godfrey made a quick sketch of the object in his notebook and then picked up his police radio to report the incident, but the line was dead. Finally, without making any noise, the object disappeared in a bright flash and Godfrey found himself sitting in his car 30 yards further up the road. Looking at his watch, the policeman was surprised because although the close encounter lasted no more than 60 seconds, 25 minutes had passed. Then he noticed an even more relevant detail, a strange burn mark that had appeared on his left leg. Godfrey was surprised and when he returned to where he had seen the light, he found that the road the car was on was completely dry, even though it had rained recently. After recounting the experience, Godfrey was met with scepticism and was even ridiculed in his own community, and so on the advice of a lawyer friend, he decided to consult a hypnotist to find out the truth about what he had seen. Through hypnosis, Godfrey recalled being blinded by the light and passing out. He told the hypnotist that he woke up in a strange room where he was being examined by several small creatures and a tall, bearded humanoid figure resembling a Nordic alien. Again, his claims were frowned upon and ridiculed. A few weeks after Godfrey's report had hit the newspapers and made international headlines, he was summoned to the Inspector General's office. There sat a man in a black suit and tie, who introduced himself as a man from the Ministry. He had a folder containing strange vehicles designed by Godfrey. Godfrey was not allowed to see the rest of the file, but he believed it contained an account of that night's events and the mysterious death of Sigmund Adamski. The man forced Godfrey to stop talking about the close encounter, which Godfrey, very reluctantly, agreed to do. The young police officer met this man several times in the following days in Todd Morden, and finally realising that he was being spied on, decided to confront him one evening in a local pub, asking him to leave and never to return. After that meeting, the ministry man disappeared and was never seen again. Godfrey still firmly believes that he was a secret agent of MI5, sent from London to take care of the case. But another theory, circulating in recent years and much supported by sceptics, would concern the fact that the stranger was actually an employee of the West Yorkshire Police, who warned Godfrey not to speak to the press to avoid drawing more attention to the police themselves. It was later revealed that several other police officers and a bus driver had seen strange lights that morning, but it was decided at the station to cover it up so as not to embarrass the police. Following the events, Godfrey was transferred, but never stopped talking about his close encounter. On the night of December the 26th, 1980, a soldier at Woodbridge Air Force Base, on patrol, saw a particularly bright red light that appeared to come from nearby Rendlesham Forest. The soldier contacted the base's control tower, who replied that no flights were in progress from either Woodbridge or the nearby Bentwaters base. It was decided to send a three-man patrol to ascertain the origin of the mysterious light. The patrol consisted of Sergeant James Penniston and Airman John Burroughs and Edward Cavansag. The three men came to a clearing, in the centre of which they reported seeing a series of strange lights, three of which included a very powerful yellow light and two smaller red and blue ones. According to the official report, Sergeant Penniston, approaching, discovered that the lights were emitted by a metal object in the shape of a pyramid, 
which seemed to rest on a kind of tripod. Suddenly, the object rose into the air for about a metre, started to move horizontally towards the forest with a zigzag trajectory and then took off vertically and disappeared into thin air. A site survey conducted in daylight revealed three traces on the ground and some level of radioactivity in the area. Two days later, on December the 28th, the military police chief of the base, alerted by a guard patrol, called Lieutenant Colonel Charles Holt, who was managing the base at the time instead of the commander, to warn him that the radar had intercepted the signal of an unidentified aircraft. Determined to ascertain the origin of the phenomenon, Holt gathered about ten men and personally took command of the team. Entering the forest, they realised they had been isolated, as a strange interference blocked radio communications, and subsequently advancing in the forest, the team would have seen a strong luminosity in the area where the Penniston team had sighted the alleged UFO two nights earlier. A soldier equipped with a Geiger counter confirmed the rise in radioactivity levels, exactly as reported in the inspection of the 26th of December. Then there was a turning point. Suddenly, the men saw an extremely bright object in the shape of an ellipse, red in colour but with a darker centre, floating among the trees, about four metres above the ground and heading east. Immediately, the soldiers walked towards the object that seemed to be moving away from them and followed it until they reached a barbed wire fence that marked the border with a field of a local farmer. The UFO continued its trajectory, stopping in the middle of the field beyond the barbed wire. Colonel Holt observed it well. It looks like it's made of cast steel, were his words. Suddenly, with a bright flash, the UFO split into five luminous white objects that hovered in the sky. As they advanced along the border of the farmer's property, the men kept seeing three of these luminous objects flying obliquely towards the sky, producing intermittent red, green and blue lights. Holt contacted the air defence base, who said they had not detected any radar signals of flying objects in the area. The men continued to observe the zigzag movement of the three luminous objects for about an hour, until Holt gave the order to return to base, where they discovered that the photos and videos taken of the observation appeared blurry and could not be used to analyse the phenomenon. On January the 13th, 1981, Lieutenant Colonel Holt sent a report of the events to the British Ministry of Defence. Various accounts have been offered for the events at Rendlesham. First, the Orford Ness Lighthouse, which emitted a fairly intense beam of light, could be seen a few kilometres from the base. That night, a bright fireball was also observed flying over the skies of southern England, a phenomenon that astronomers attributed to the passage of a meteor. Sergeant Penniston's observation of the metallic object may have been a misinterpretation due to his poor night vision. As regards the measurements of radioactivity, it was ascertained that the apparatus used was not calibrated to take into account background radiation. Putting these facts together, Science writer Ian Ridpath explained the facts as a series of misinterpretations. The first observation, made by a soldier on December the 26th, could be related to a comet or a fireball, while the subsequent light observations could be related to light generated by the Orford Ness Lighthouse. The sceptic Stuart Campbell agrees with the hypothesis of a fireball, but he has also given an alternative explanation, citing the shipwash lightship, whose light would also be visible from the location where the events occurred. 
An alternative explanation to that of the fireball is that the lights observed on the night of the 26th of December could have been those of a police car, driven by the policeman Kevin Conde, who would have modified the flashing siren of his car. However, Conde denied the fact, stating that in those days he was on holiday for the Christmas holidays and therefore had not been on patrol. Other possible explanations have called into question the re-entry into the atmosphere of the last stage of a carrier rocket, which in those days put a Soviet spy satellite into orbit. The existence of the NSA Research Center, which specializes in laser technology research, has also been reported, and the observed light could have been caused by experiments conducted in this center. Alternatively, the whole thing was organized by a military group, including Lieutenant Colonel Holt, to cover up a spy satellite recovery operation. Finally, however, at least for once, it was possible to solve this intricate puzzle. About 20 years later, during which the Rendlesham sighting became famous among ufology enthusiasts, in 2003, this mysterious event was resolved thanks to a BBC report in which an article revealed what had really happened on those two evenings. Basically, former military police officer Kevin Conde confessed in 2003 that the December 26th sighting had been a prank organised by himself, where he had suddenly turned on the patrol car's flashing sirens and headlights. At the time, and for the following 20 years, worried by the uproar that surrounded the event, Condé never clarified his involvement for fear of sanctions, but as he was now retired, he decided to tell the truth. Further investigation showed that, that evening, only Sergeant Penniston reported seeing an object, while the other men on the patrol reported only lights. Furthermore, the United States Air Force stated that there was no official investigation into these facts in relation to alleged UFO hypotheses, since after the closure of Project Blue Book, the US military had ceased to investigate UFOs. On the 1st of December 1987, a mysterious event shook the peaceful Ilkley Moor in West Yorkshire, United Kingdom. A retired police officer, Philip Spencer, claimed he was abducted by alien beings during a morning walk. What happened that day would throw a sinister light on the UFO phenomenon. According to Spencer's account, while on a hill, he sighted an unusual figure on the path ahead of him. The figure was dark green in colour, about four feet tall, with an enormous head and long, thin arms. The creature made a gesture that Spencer interpreted as a warning, but despite this, he decided to take a picture of it with his camera. Then the creature fled, and Spencer followed it, but he lost it in the fog. Next, he noticed a spaceship lift off the moor and disappear into the sky. He describes the spaceship as whitish in colour, consisting of two saucer-shaped parts connected to each other, and it was accompanied by a loud humming sound. He didn't manage to take a picture of the spaceship. After this encounter, Instead of continuing along his planned route, Spencer headed to another city, which was about half an hour away. When he arrived, he found that it had been about two hours longer than he expected. Also, he noticed that the compass he was carrying was pointing in the opposite direction than expected.
Spencer's photograph immediately became the subject of intense speculation. According to him, it clearly showed one of the aliens who had abducted him. While some experts were sceptical and argued that the photo could be the result of an optical illusion or a hoax, others saw it as a possible clue to the existence of extraterrestrial life. The Ilkley Moor incident had a lasting impact on Philip Spencer's life. While trying to shed some light on what had happened to him, Spencer collided with doubt, scepticism and prejudice. Despite his insistence, his testimony was widely questioned, leaving the event shrouded in mystery. The Ilkley Moor incident still remains open, without a definitive explanation. Theories about the UFO phenomenon vary, ranging from the possibility of real extraterrestrial encounters to the hypothesis of psychological phenomena or even a well-conceived hoax. The Ilkley Moor mystery continues to spark curiosity and debate in the UFO community and beyond. Scotland has more UFO reports than any other region. Scotland has always been associated with mystery and the paranormal. We recall, among other things, the alleged Loch Ness Monster, the mysterious and legendary prehistoric animal that lived in Loch Ness, nicknamed Nessie. Scottish folklore is full of spells, demons and curses. But in one area of Scotland, called the Falkirk Triangle, more than half of the population report having seen UFOs. The Falkirk Triangle is an area of Scotland which over the years has been the subject of various reports of UFO sightings and unexplained phenomena. It is a geographical area which includes the towns of Falkirk, Bonnybridge and Grangemouth and over the last 30 years has gained a reputation as one of the busiest UFO areas in the UK. In the 1990s in particular, Bonnybridge became known as the UFO capital of the world due to the large number of reported sightings in that area. Numerous witnesses claim to have seen unidentified flying objects of various shapes and sizes in the sky over Falkirk, including luminous disks, flashing lights and black triangles. Reports of UFO sightings in the Falkirk Triangle area have been so frequent that they have attracted the attention of the media and ufologists from all over the world. Some ufologists argue that the concentration of UFO sightings in this area could be due to geographical factors, such as the activity of power lines or the presence of magnetic fields. The specific geographical area covers 1,295 square kilometres and, as already mentioned, has the shape of an isosceles triangle, with its vertices located in the cities of Falkirk to the north, Glasgow to the west and Edinburgh to the east. The town most affected by this type of activity is undoubtedly Bonnybridge. Bonnybridge is a small settlement within the Falkirk Council area of Scotland. Situated 6 kilometres west of Falkirk, 8 kilometres northeast of Cumbernauld and 13.4 kilometres south-southwest of Stirling, the town is also home to the remains of Rough Castle Fort, the most intact of the surviving Roman wall fortifications, located southeast of Bonnybridge, where everything began. It was 1992 when James Walker observed unusual lights in the sky on his way home. Initially, he believed they were simple stars, but observing their movement and subsequent transformation into a triangular shape, he was taken aback. Following this incident, reports of UFO sightings in Bonnybridge increased 
a hundredfold. Local politician Billy Buchanan began receiving an increasing number of reports about alleged UFO sightings. As the frequency of these reports continued to increase, Buchanan felt it necessary to address the phenomenon. He wrote a letter to the Queen, the Prime Minister and the Ministry of Defence, asking to shed light on these strange events. Obviously, he was not listened to, but the peculiarity of this story brought wide publicity, causing a wave of people to come forward, claiming to have witnessed UFO sightings in the region. Undoubtedly, Craig Malcolm was one of the crucial witnesses in the area, thanks in part to his video recordings of strange UFOs crossing the Scottish sky without any interruption for approximately 16 hours in 1993. Craig arranged meetings with like-minded people and spent whole nights with them, trying to document evidence of the existence of UFOs. Like Craig, Billy Buchanan also gave himself the personal mission of trying to explain these strange phenomena, reaching a surprising conclusion. Undoubtedly, whatever was happening in the skies of Scotland, it could not be attributed to human origin. With time and the advent of the internet, obviously the story relating to this hotspot grew dramatically, also generating a large number of conspiracy theories, among which, certainly the most interesting, speaks of a secret military installation, a sort of British Area 51, where they would carry out experiments on latest generation aircraft based on flying saucers recovered over the years by His Majesty's government. Many more sightings became known about through the phased release between 2008 and 2013 of Ministry of Defence UFO sighting reports by the National Archives. UK Ministry of Defence declassified documents relating to unidentified flying object activities provide an overview of the investigation and reporting of alleged sightings in the UK as they cover a large time period, with some documents dating back to the 1950s and 60s, while others extend up to 2009. Inside the documents, one can find official reports, correspondence, photographs, audio recordings and other material related to UFO sightings. These include reports from members of the public, military personnel, police and other reputable sources. The documents also reveal the Ministry of Defence's efforts to seek rational explanations for the sightings, such as atmospheric phenomena, conventional aircraft, satellites, rockets or elaborate hoaxes. However, in some cases, a definitive explanation could not be provided. The opening of the files has obviously helped to stimulate public debate on the UFO phenomenon, raising questions about the possibility of extraterrestrial life and government transparency regarding UFO investigations. Among those disclosed, there have been reported sightings of UFOs that were stationary in front of Parliament and in the vicinity of Stonehenge. The documents indicate that the UFO office also received hotline calls about alleged alien contacts, such as a man who claimed in 2008 that he had lived with an alien for some time and another individual who claimed a UFO stole his dog, car and tent while he was camping in 2007. But among the thousands of reports, some are really curious, which is why we decided to take some examples, ranging from the 50s to the early 2000s. The 14th to the 25th of September 1952. Operation Mainbrace. On September the 19th at 10.53, a silver disc-shaped object followed two Air Force aircraft in training. The phenomenon was observed by the military on the ground. First, the object followed the trail of a Gloucester Meteor aircraft returning to base, and later stationed itself at the rear of an ultralight RAF Topcliffe aircraft. In the long chase, the object rotated as it hovered within striking distance of the two RAF aircraft. 
After a few minutes, it finally headed west, at high speed. Subsequently, on the 21st of September, six RAF aircraft tracked a spherical object over the North Sea. It too then flew off at great speed, leaving the pilots with more questions than answers. On the 4th of April 1957, a large object was seen on RAF West Fro radar near Stranra at 15,000 metres, which remained stationary for 10 minutes over the Irish Sea. It moved vertically to 21,000 metres and was also tracked by radar at Ardwell. The cigar-shaped object was described as being as large as a cargo ship and was observed making a sharp turn that was aerodynamically impossible. AM, PCs Roger Willey and Clifford Waycott were driving from Holsworthy to Hatherley along the A3072 road when they saw a bright cross-shaped object at about 15 minutes along the road, travelling at high speeds approaching 100 km per hour. Then at about 4.23 this first flying object was joined by a second. Both disappeared around 5 a.m. after being chased for 40 kilometers. April the 21st, 1991. Airline pilot Achille Zaghetti of Grosseto, Tuscany, aboard an Alitalia McDonnell Douglas MD-80 on a flight from Milan to Heathrow, saw a three meter long khaki colored object in the skies above Lid in Kent. The UFO was 300 meters from the plane and was also detected by the radar of nearby London Lid Airport. March the 31st, 1993. Several witnesses in the southwest and west of England saw a large triangular shaped UFO hurtling across the sky, leaving a trail of light. Analysis of the sightings by the Ministry of Defense concluded that the object was the re-entry of a Russian rocket combined with a subsequent sighting of a police helicopter. After entering the new millennium, British singer Kim Wilde reported on the 26th of June 2009 that she saw a huge bright light behind a cloud above her garden in Hertfordshire. She described the light as brighter than the moon, but similar to moonlight. Upon further inspection, Wilde reported seeing the light move very quickly from about 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. Then it moved back and forth for several minutes. Each time it moved, something moved through the air, but it was silent, absolutely silent. A second report of this UFO was later made by a colleague based in Hertfordshire, who had managed to obtain photographic evidence to support the apparent sighting. In conclusion, this documentary has offered an in-depth and engaging look into the phenomenon of UFO sightings and the declassified government files relating to the UK's Ministry of Defence. Over the course of our narration, we have explored numerous intriguing cases, credible testimonies and official documents that prompted us to ponder the possibilities of an extraterrestrial presence in our reality. Thanks to the analysis of experts, investigators and eyewitnesses, we have been able to gain a broader perspective on UFO phenomena and the British government's attempts to understand them. Opening the secret files was a significant step towards transparency. However, despite the efforts made to investigate UFOs, the documentary has shown that the ultimate truth remains elusive. Many of the sightings cannot be convincingly explained, leaving room for theory, conjecture and a sense of wonder of the mystery of the unknown. What clearly emerges is that the UFO phenomenon still deserves attention and further research. We must continue to explore, study and carefully analyse the sightings and available evidence to shed light on the mysteries surrounding these events. Ultimately, the documentary prompted us to ask fundamental questions about our position in the universe and the possibility of other intelligent life forms out there. 
Perhaps through the deepening of these investigations and the disclosure of more secret files, we will one day be able to unravel the truth behind UFO sightings and discover new and fascinating perspectives regarding our existence in the infinite cosmos.